but it's more how we saw ourselves. And that is so important, it was missing in this entire discussion of not what somebody said, what our relationship was supposed to be, and what kind of permission some we were supposed to have, and this document said, and you have to, and you're supposed to, and you're not, and we sue, and blah, 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 blah. And he went through it. He changed himself in this process. So he changed how we were to see ourselves, which was the most dangerous thing to the man. And I do everything I can to help him have a voice, and I'm glad you're here, you know, to be able to witness this and participate and talk to Larkin Rose. Hillary 2016! Thank you. Um, I'm not going to do what I do with most audiences, because I suspect what I say to most audiences all of you know already anyway. Um, this isn't just preaching to the choir, this is like preaching to a collection of ministers. <laughs> Am not. So, <laughs> what I'd like to get into instead has to do with how the world is going to fix. Because I think, you know, for me, most of what I've learned uh, over the, the past however many years has had more to do with human psychology than with the actual philosophical issue. Because the philosophical issue is idiotically simple. The concept that you own yourself, I mean, how much explaining does that require? The only reason it requires anybody saying anything is because of the massive amount of energy and time put into training people to not see the bleeding obvious, to not embrace the concept that you own yourself, that it's not okay to attack people, that it's not okay when other people attack you. It takes a massive amount of propaganda and indoctrination and they start when kids are really little to make them accept the idea that certain people have the right to commit aggression against you. You know, we don't hit unless we're the big people and you're the little people, or we're the cop and you're the not cop. Then we hit, but that's different because that's authority and we have all these weird rituals and stuff that makes that okay. It takes a massive amount of indoctrination to get people to believe an insanely complicated and convoluted lie. And that's the only reason it takes this much effort to show them what is really a simple truth because they have to overcome the garbage that's been stuck in their heads. And I want to talk a little bit about what I have found to be the best ways to do that. Now I'm not going to say this is exactly how everybody should do it. I will say that over the last 18 years of being an anarchist and having one-on-one -on -one discussions with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of statists or one-on-one, -on -one, or one-on-three, or one-on-ten, or one-on, you know, any size group you can think of. This is what I find to be the most effective approach. And I'm, I'm working on a huge interactive project, um, and this isn't a commercial for that, because it's going to be free when it's done. It has to be free. Uh, but it gets into a lot of things that... <laughs> I'm Gandalf. Oh, <laughs> there can be only one. <laughs> get into a lot of things that have to do with the psychology because when we if you walk up to somebody the average status and you say government is unnecessary and it's illegitimate and it's nasty and horrible and evil and they say no it's good and we need it and it, it helps the poor and it builds roads and it protects us nothing really happened they heard an assertion of an outside idea that didn't match theirs and they were already comfortable with theirs, and they thought, your idea is weird and foreign and wrong, go away. The fact that you were completely 100% right didn't make any difference in how much of an effect, a positive effect you had, because it didn't make it through their barrier of, I'm comfortable with what I already believe. And the reason there is actually hope is that it isn't just a competition of assertions. You know, you proclaim that chocolate ice cream is best, and he proclaims that vanilla is I ice cream is best, and you can scream at each other, and nothing is going to change because they're just assertions. The Achilles right heel of statism is that every single person in the world who believes in government has a contradiction inside his own head. Everything he needs to disprove government is already in his own head. You don't have to put it there. Every moral code, every piece of logic, every ability to reason is already there. The key is
to make him see it inside his own head so that he sees the problem in his own belief system. And I know how tempting it is. I, I love to argue and I love to tell people how wrong they are and do that whole fun game. And I know how tempting it is to just stick an assertion there. Your assertion is that taxes are the price we pay for civilization and my assertion is taxes are the price we pay to destroy civilization. And we could both yell the same sentence at each other forever. But if instead you can take somebody and walk them through their own belief system where they are judge and jury the whole time. And I won't for a second pretend I do this all the time. But I've been practicing this and for this, for this interactive project it's entirely this. The status gets to be judge and jury of everything. He gets to decide true and false. He gets to decide right and wrong. Because the moment he thinks that you are trying to stick your moral code above his, you already lost. You're not going to accomplish anything. Because you're telling him you're a bad person because what you fundamentally believe in, what you're all about, sucks. You're an evil idiot. Please be smart and good by throwing away your belief system and adopting mine. Nobody responds well to that. However, if you can convey to him, you are being tricked into betraying your own values, not mine. It doesn't matter that I don't approve of your beliefs or what you advocate or what you do. You are betraying your own values, your own priorities, your own belief system, and being tricked into acting against your own best interests. And a simple analogy is there's some charity that you give to every year and you think it's out there helping the poor or something. If what they were actually doing is buying bombs to throw at innocent people, wouldn't you want to know that? Or would you rather say, well, I feel good giving to this charity, so don't tell me what's actually happening. Wouldn't you want to know that, well, I thought it was helping good people. Good, your motives are good. If you go to a status and say your motives are evil, First of all, they're not ever going to be on your side, and they're not going to listen to anything you have to say, and you won't win them over because you just told them what you fundamentally are inside is my enemy. And luckily, that isn't actually the case. What they fundamentally are inside <coughs> is anarchists who want a voluntary society, and they've been taught a level of crap on top of that that has warped their perceptions so badly that they are advocating evil and not noticing. And I know because I advocated evil and didn't notice for years and years and years. I believed in political action and we got to vote the right people in and petition for this and that and the other thing. And of course people have to pay their taxes because the world will explode for some reason if people don't pay their taxes. <laughs> and I assumed these things because I was taught these things. And I, with my best of intentions and throwing all my energy and enthusiasm into the game thought I was fighting for the good guys. And so the problem was not I was trying to be evil. The problem was something in between the good intentions and the actions was turning good intentions into evil. And if someone can be shown, if they can be invited to consider the possibility that they have been tricked into going against themselves, that will matter to them a whole lot more than you're doing something that I don't approve of. Because their natural reaction is, well, I don't care what you approve of, I care what I approve of. And they think when they advocate government, you know, the, the political left thinks they are for helping the poor. And they will say, I'm for helping the poor. And they feel like they are for helping the poor. And if you walk them through it step by step, okay, well, how do you help the poor? Well, I want a government that gives housing and this and that and then food and this and that. Where do they get the money for that? And usually they have to think about it because they haven't even thought that far. Because they're, they, they have so much fun feeling good about wanting to help the poor, they haven't even thought enough to go, well, I have taxes, I guess. Okay, and what happens to the people who don't pay? Who don't hand over the money? Well, you should. You should be happy to give to the poor. Okay, you should be happy to give to the poor. What happens to the people who don't? And they all know inside their heads, again, they all have the information in their heads already, that bad things happen to people who say, I'm not going to give my money to the government. It's not that they don't know that, they haven't thought about it, and they haven't thought through, wow, I'm actually saying, I want him and him and him to give to the poor, and be hurt if they don't. 
because I voted for that guy to make them give to the poor. And just to get them to realize, just to get them to put two and two together, they already have the two and the two in their heads. Everybody already knows nasty things are done to you if you disobey the law. And everybody already knows that that's where government gets its money. And if they can be shown two plus two and start to be uncomfortable and think, yeah, I'm not sure that's really a good way to help the poor. I'm basically saying I want a bunch of people terrorized in the name of helping the poor. And the, the equivalent on the right is, well, I'm for you know protecting the innocent by having a police force. Okay, how's it funded? You can go through it again. Again, they know all the facts they need to know. They have all the moral code they need to have to be moral voluntarists. It's just they've never put two and two together, and since before they could even speak, they've been taught that two plus two equals five. And if you come up and start with the conclusion, and it sounds to them like an outside foreign idea, it feels like an attack on their value system. And they feel like you're saying, what you are is bad, what I am is good. And I find that the approach that actually works is, what you are is good, but tricked. Because that is absolutely the case. And that is something that if they, because if, if you tell somebody, I think you're totally a good person, I think you mean well, you're trying to do good stuff, but I can demonstrate to you that you're accidentally harming innocent people, just like I did for years and years. Then, not everybody will think about it because a lot of people still have that shell that they like to live inside of. I don't want to reconsider anything because that's uncomfortable. But those who are willing to listen at all, I find that's the most effective way to get them to reconsider. And again, I like to argue and it often turns into a combat, but then from their perspective, there's an outside idea trying to get in. Instead of somebody saying, look at that thing in your brain and look at that thing in your brain and put them next to each other and what do you see? All we need to do to make the entire world voluntarist is say, look at that thing in your brain, look at that thing in your brain, put them right next together, and what do you see? Now, it usually takes a little more time than that because they've been trained to not see the bleeding obvious, but that's really all that has to happen. And this interactive thing I'm doing does it in, in detail, but the entire time that the, the, the narrator of this interactive thing, um, I'll try to give a really brief explanation of it. Basically, it, it replaces me talking to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. So far, the best scenario I can think of is somebody open to a discussion. It's one-on-one, -on -one, there's no peer pressure, nobody else is watching, they're willing to have a, a calm, rational discussion, and reconsider their thought process. First of all, it's really hard just to get to that scenario. But when I can, so far that's been uh, the best, the, the highest success rate, if you want to call it that, of getting people to reconsider their statism and throw it away. Even in that setting, there are a bunch of psychological obstacles. If you're, as soon as there are two people there, and somebody says, you believe this, I want you to consider something else. People are naturally on the defensive. Because when you say that, however politely you say it, they hear it as, you're wrong about something. And people naturally don't want to be wrong, especially if you're there in front of them, the one telling them they're wrong about something. And they are, by the way. Seven billion people are hugely wrong about this. I'm not saying that isn't the case. I'm saying if they feel the message to be, you're wrong about something, they go on the defensive because they feel like they're being attacked. In this interactive thing, there isn't even that. There's not a person there. There's a narrator who never says I, who never asserts any opinion, who never has a position, who never uh, expresses any sort of moral judgment at all, or judgment about the person's, you know, like, you contradicted yourself, you idiot. Doesn't do that in the slightest. Let's the person figure out for themselves where there are contradictions just by going through certain lines of questioning. And what makes it complicated is that the discussion can go in a million different directions and this program has to be able to go in all of those directions. So it's customized so that it will go in different directions for different people doing it. But the fundamental thing that needs to happen is the person has to find the truth for himself. And I think it's probably a safe bet that everybody here, what you now believe in, do you think 
that was a foreign idea smashed into your head, <laughs> or do you feel like you woke up to see a truth? Renee, Renee told me this morning. Yeah, and it's true of everybody, because as long as it feels like it was a foreign idea, it's not yours, you don't adopt it. You see it for yourself, and then you go, oh. And I remember arguing the other direction and arguing, you know, vehemently arguing for statism <laughs> and thinking I was right, and being on the defensive and ha ha ha, I can argue with you and, and try to win a debate. They have to feel totally safe in being able to pause and think. And that's another, there are so many little psychological hurdles that, you know, I've heard, you know, I'm sure all of you have, have shared in the thing of it's so hard to talk to people because they don't understand, they won't even accept the most basic logic and the most basic reasoning and you talk to them and their brains just go flying off on these bizarre tangents. They can't follow a simple train of logic. Their moral principles seem just random. And a lot of that is just because of the weird way that the human brain reacts to new ideas. And one little example is if you're talking to somebody and you ask them a question, like you ask them, can you delegate to somebody else a right you don't have? The, the moment you stop speaking, those words come out of your mouth and you stop. And then there's a silence. And because of the, human, the way the human brain works, instantly the person is uncomfortable. They know they're on the spot. They know if they sit there and don't say anything, they're going to look like a complete idiot. So their immediate concern is, words have to come out of my face. Uh, yeah, or no, or something. And the moment they've said something, then they have to be invested in it, because they don't want to say yes. Wait, that was stupid. No. Wait, that was even stupider. As soon as they say anything, they will want to defend whatever they said. So even if you're perfectly polite and passive and completely open and gentle about it, just the fact that you're there and asked a question, they don't want to sit there and pause for 10 minutes saying nothing because that's just psychologically uncomfortable. They've just been asked a direct question and to just sit there and say, uh, the reason there is such a thing as um is because people don't like to hear silence when they know it's their turn to have to say something. So we go um to fill in the silence until we can think of something more coherent. So imagine that there's a narrator who isn't there who asks a question and they can sit there silently thinking for three hours if they feel like it before deciding what answer to give. And if they say yes, wait, maybe not yes, yes kind of seems dumb, there's nobody there to go, ha ha, you said something dumb. They can back up, there's no judgment, there's no, well why did you contradict yourself? So in this interactive thing, whenever people want, they can back up and change an answer. And it never says, ha-ha, gotcha. It's never trying to catch them. It's never trying to trick them. It's never trying to tie them into an answer and, and make them have to defend it. It does the exact opposite. It says, hey, you're judge and jury. You decide if it's okay. And if, it, if some point along the way you say, wait, I don't know how I got here, but now it doesn't make sense. I better back up and fix something. There's no one there to bash them over the head. And again, as gentle, and I've tried to do it really gently with a bunch of people, but there is still... Uh, a huge psychological obstacle to people thinking about an idea as bizarre and radical as no ruling class. Now to most of us here, I think the bizarre radical thing is imagining that somebody can have the right to rule you. To most of the world, the bizarre radical thing is imagining that nobody has the right to rule you. And to change that perception, they have to look inside their own head and see by their moral codes and their logic, nobody can possibly have the right to rule them. And it's pretty darn easy to prove that just using their beliefs and their moral codes. And it, But it's so tempting and it's so much quicker and easier to just throw your moral code at them. You can't delegate a right you don't have. And I mean, another little psychological thing is if you go up to somebody and say, you can't delegate a right you don't have, so if I can't tax you, Congress can't tax you. All of that is totally true. It's a really simple concept. The logic is idiotically obvious. But most people will sort of, like, I, I, don't really, I haven't thought about that yet, so it doesn't all the way, all the way register. <laughs> and so I don't all the way agree because I don't even all the way know what you said. If you put it in the form of a question, and it's, this is just one of a million little psychological tricks. If they have to answer, can you delegate a right you don't have, they have to think. Because to make some words come out of their mouth, or to press a button, yes or no, 
they have to think because you didn't just put your idea in front of them. You said, which of these ideas is yours? And you can get any person, any statist, anybody who believes in government to directly contradict himself, to directly show that his morals go against the belief in statism, his own. And I don't care if he's a complete fascist or a communist or a constitutionalist, right-wing, left-wing, it doesn't matter. If you know the right lines of questioning, you can get him to crash into himself without you having to introduce a single moral principle or idea or logic if you can guide him through his own head to see where he has been trained to accept a contradiction. And it takes more effort and it takes more practice because it's a lot easier to say, you're an idiot and you're advocating evil. And it's true. That is true, but saying that doesn't do any good because of the way the human brain works. And so I know, and I know from first-hand experience, and I know from talking to a zillion people how frustrating it is to talk to good people, intelligent, educated people, who still advocate the enslavement of mankind because their brain has never considered anything else. The realm of possibilities they have ever heard on the TV or from their teachers or from their parents or from most of society is, do you want a right jackboot on your throat or do you want a left jackboot on your throat? And if you're considerate and moderate, you want both on your throat kind of evenly, and that makes you progressive and, and wise. They don't know there is anything else. And I know because I didn't know there was anything else. I thought that was the whole spectrum of possibilities. And it's so funny because when I discuss things with people, if I'm talking to a left-leaning statist, a lot of the time he'll accuse me of being a right-leaning statist. Because all he knows is I'm not what he is, so I must be that thing. And if I'm talking to a right-leaning statist, he accuses me of being a left-leaning statist. Because he doesn't know there's anything else. And my response to that is usually I can demonstrate in a few questions that that far other side of the political spectrum, you have way more in common with him than I do with either one of you. But if they don't find it themselves, if we don't sort of start with the assumption that they're good enough people, because if you start with the assumption that someone's genuinely evil, you're not going to talk them into being good. It just doesn't work that way. If they're genuinely evil, run the other way. If you assume that they're intelligent enough and good enough that they can become a civilized human being who doesn't advocate violence, then let them find it. Basically, just put the path in front of them, let them walk down it, instead of grabbing them by the nose and saying, walk this way, please. And, you know, I've done my share of trying to do that because it's really tempting. Like, how can you not see that this is where you should be? It's so obvious. It's only obvious when you're there. When I wasn't there, it wasn't at all obvious that voluntarism is the only sane, moral thing to be. Because everything else you can be is an involuntarist. And that cannot be moral. But back when I was an involuntarist, a statist, I didn't see it that way. I didn't understand that those were the, the options. And I didn't want to be dragged to somewhere that to me looked foreign and weird and wrong and immoral. And so, the good news is, uh, you know, people ask me, well, what do you think the chances are that we're going to actually someday have a society without government? 100%, absolutely 100%. Now, how long we take to get there is a bigger question. But it is 100% for the same reason that it was absolutely destined that eventually the human race would know the Earth is spherical and not flat because the evidence is going to stare them in the face until they accept it, and once they accept it and understand it, they're never going back. Once people see the evidence that the concept of authority in government is inherently contradictory and immoral and insane, they give it up, they don't go back. How many anarchists you know have gone back to statism? It's a one-way trip. And when you get to the point of recognizing the insanity of the belief you were taught, and you see it for what it is, you know, speaking for myself, I, first of all, I'm really darn embarrassed I ever believed that. I'm really embarrassed that I vehemently advocated that. Now, I was sort of advocating for, I want a little tyrant who's pretty darn nice to us, 
And I thought that was all wise because most people wanted an even bigger tyrant. So I felt like, well, I'm in the right direction, right? But looking back on believing that, uh, when I believe that, I cannot imagine, I literally cannot imagine believing that now. And I look back then and I say, how did I hold those things inside my head and think they all fit together? Like, what would the old me have said if I said, well, can you delegate to, write to somebody else a right you don't have? Hopefully I would be smart enough to say, no, of course not. Well, then how did Congress, can two people delegate a right that neither of them have? And you've probably all heard this line of questioning. Well, no, of course not. Well, then how did the people in Congress get a right to tax when none of the people who voted for them had the right to begin with? Um, 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 it, it's a very, it, it's very simple logic, it's very simple morality. And when I think back to the old me and see the contradictions that were in my head, I think, how did I not see that they were there? And it's because the, the belief in government is a religious faith. Yeah. It is a belief, and I used, to, I used to think the belief in government was analogous to a religion. And then I realized it is a religion. It's not just an analogy. They believe in a superhuman entity that you cannot see that has rights that human beings don't have and when it issues commands it's a sin for human beings to disobey that's called a deity and the fact that the excuse for it is really convoluted and bizarre and they don't even try to make it supernatural doesn't make it any less of a deity in fact i would say the belief in government is not only a religion but the most dangerous insane religion that has ever been because it's at least hard to disprove that there's a deity on a different plane of existence because well, how would you go there to say look he isn't there but in the case of government they don't even pretend that anymore I mean we got over the divine right of kings uh, God said I'm in charge well it's kind of hard to prove he didn't say that but I'm pretty sure he didn't now they don't even use that excuse they said well we had a bunch of people and we wrote things and moved things around and wore suits and built buildings and now we have the right to rule it's like, wait, I don't care what happened in between. If all you had was pieces of paper and buildings and people, you can't possibly have somehow acquired an exemption from morality. You're just people. But the belief in government requires the belief that rituals and documents and constitutions and elections and bizarre, you know, the inauguration, which is basically the crowning of a king, that that somehow gave somebody special rights and the right to rule. Without that, there isn't government. And so it was, you know, it was rude awakening for me when I realized government is absolutely a religion, and it's the easiest religion to prove to be utterly insane and completely immoral and completely anti-human and horribly destructive. And it's 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 funny or sad to look at how many vehement atheists are still state worshippers. Um, Richard Dawkins is a big one. There are a bunch of other ones. And it's so funny that every single argument they use completely demolishes their own position on government. And they don't see it. And I've said before, not you can be an anarchist without being an atheist. You can't be an atheist without being an anarchist. You might not recognize that the thing you believe in is a god, but if you believe in government, you absolutely believe in a deity above you with the right to rule you. And the so the only obstacle is not that the people are evil. You can't talk evil people into being good. It's not that the people aren't capable of understanding this. I mean, who here thinks the concept that I own myself is beyond the comprehension skills of their friends and neighbors? It's intellectually, it's idiotically obvious. And when we get frustrated that they don't adopt it, it's not because they can't comprehend that. A three-year-old already comprehends that without even telling him. It's that garbage has been put in the way of their moral code and their understanding that makes them not see what they would see without anyone having to tell it to them. And our only mission, well, I'll speak for myself, but... <laughs> My only mission is to take the garbage out of their way and let them be them. You cannot impose freedom on a human being. You can invite them to be free 
by saying you're wearing chains, I think you should take them off. The truth of the matter is, you know, you can take physical chains off a human being. You cannot take mental chains off a human being. You can say, there they are, there are the chains, there's the key right there. Put that in that lock and turn it. You can't turn it yourself. You can only invite them to do it. And I know from lots of experience how tempting to say, put it in the gate, here, let me do it. It doesn't work because their mind has to free itself. And I still, for the life of me, don't know what it is that makes some people unlock it and some people not unlock it. I can't even say, looking back at me and my own history of being a statist and then, then escaping the, the, the superstition of authority, I don't know what changed. I still don't know why I ever dared to back up enough to go, yeah, there's a chain around my brain, that sucks, let's do away with that. And I've watched so many people, and I've watched people who are minicists. I want the tiniest little government. And you go through this explanation a zillion times, ten years later, no, I still want that tiny little bit of government, and I'm terrified of thinking about anything else. And I know self-avowed statist communists who a week later were anarcho-capitalists. <laughs> because they dared to look at it, and for whatever reason, they dared to pick up the, the key and put it in the lock and go, oh yeah, that feels much better, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but they have to do it, which means we have to invite them to do it. We cannot take the locks off of their brains. Nobody could take the lock off of my brain when it was on there but me. Other people could put all sorts of information in front of me to make it really easy. Point out the lock, point out the key, to have an instruction manual on how to put the key in the lock. But it has to be the individual's choice. And we always have to remember that. And that sort of gets to the root of freedom. You cannot force somebody to be free. You can invite them to be free. And even at that base level of thinking about stuff, I don't know what makes some people think about it and other people not think about it. And But, but coming to that realization is also, a, it was a huge relief for me because I don't know how many people have seen that, that cartoon of, the guy is up late at night on the, the typing way on the computer and it's all dark outside. Honey, come to bed. Uh, just a minute, someone is still wrong on the internet. <laughs> I totally had that attitude. I wanted to keep arguing until they wise up and agree with me. And it was really frustrating. And I know a bunch of people who are so frustrated that they say, I'm not talking to anybody. This is so frustrating. I can't believe people can't understand this. I have a tantrum run away. And the only thing that made me able to deal, be able to be at peace with people being stupid and indoctrinated, to be rude about it, is realizing it's their choice. I, all I can do is stick the manual in front of them that says there's the key, there's the lock. If you want to open it, be my guest. If you don't, I can't make you. And if you're there telling me there's no, there's no chains on me, no, I don't see them, I'm not going to look. All I can do is go, oh, well, that's okay. That's too bad. <laughs> I'm going to go try somebody else. It's the illusion that we can control somebody else. I mean, that's the ultimate irony, is that we as people who love freedom, the temptation is there is we want to control them and make them understand freedom, which is, you know, this bizarre paradox that we want that because we want them to be free, but we also want to make them understand it. And it doesn't work that way. And the beauty is if you back up and understand the human psychology and how it works, it is very possible and it is very effective on a very large percentage of people to get them to see the key, to see the lock, to unlock it, to step out, to look back at the chains and go, why didn't I see those chains for the first 20, 30, however many years of my life? And I think most of us here have probably gone through that. Um, who here has never been a statist? Show of hands. <laughs> Who here has been a statist but got over it? He's still one. So we've gone through the process. Who here has trouble imagining ever believing in statism again? It just, once you see the insanity of it, you just think, How, well, why was that ever in my head? Why did I ever allow it to be in my head? So we've all been back where most of the world still is. And we weren't evil 
We weren't there because we were evil. We weren't there because we were stupid. We didn't get good. We didn't get intelligent and then turn into this. We happen to look at the lock and key and go, yeah, maybe there's a chain there. Maybe I should do something about that. And that's why we're here instead of there. And what we need is for the rest of the world to be here instead of there. So there isn't perpetual war and oppression and all sorts of nasty stuff happening. Including the fact that the enforcers can get from here. And I know how easy it is to be angry and, and, and frustrated at, at, at cops and soldiers who are out there committing evil. And I'm all in favor of defending against their aggression. But I have been thrilled over the last few years at how many uh, soldiers and cops, soldiers more so than cops, or more often than cops, have woken up, seen the truth, and turned around and said, I used to be an agent of evil. And then I recognized the problem. Um, I know a whole bunch of Marines who are now anarchists, which is pretty amazing because when you are in that position where you have a vested interest, your career is built around the lie of authoritarianism. To still dare to step back and say, yeah, this whole thing is sitting on a lie. This is bogus. I was fighting for the wrong side. I was the bad guy. That I'm not sure I could do that. If I was in the Marines, I'm not sure I would have been able to back up enough to look at it honestly enough to become a voluntarist. But I know a whole lot of people who have done that just in the past few years, and it's speeding up. So I guess I would say, in closing, and then people can ask questions or throw things at me or wander off or do whatever you want. Um, there is reason to be optimistic. Don't get discouraged simply because when you throw the truth at people, it bounces off. The problem is not that they're evil. The problem is not that they're stupid. It's that when you throw truth at people, they view it as an outside, foreign, horrible, scary thing, and they want to defend themselves. They already have the truth inside them. They just need to be shown how to put two and two together and come up with four. And if it doesn't feel like an outside force, if it feels like inviting them through it, suddenly you'll find, whoa, they, they really can think about these things. They really can find the conclusion for themselves. They can embrace it and understand it just as much as I can. Now, it won't be everybody. Lots of people will choose not to unlock those chains. But it's a lot of people. And I'm, especially more and more recently, because this has been spreading exponentially in the last you know, a few years. I did a, as a quick aside, I, I did a, a, a very unscientific poll on Facebook and I said of the anarchists here, and I was up to 4,000 friends or something, um, say about what year you gave up statism. Because, like, how recently was it? Was it ages ago? For me, it was 18 years ago. I've been ranting the same stuff for 18 years. And somebody else plotted a curve and it goes like this. About 90% of the anarchists I know weren't anarchists three years ago, which means it is speeding up a lot. And the faster it speeds up, the more it speeds up, because more people are hearing it. And so on the optimistic note, as frustrating it is as it is, yes, when you throw truth at people, it bounces off, because it feels like an outside external thing that they don't want and they defend themselves. If you can invite them to take the truth and the morality that they already have inside and add them up and put them together and be true to their own values, because no status is true to his own values. No status is true to his own logic. I wasn't when I was one. And invite them into actually civilized society, a whole lot of people, a way higher percentage than most people would think, are capable of completely understanding and completely adopting the concept of a voluntary society. So don't give up just because it's frustrating. Back up and keep in mind we're dealing with a very complicated, very bizarre machine known as the human mind. And we have to see how it works and get around the weird trigger mechanisms that make people not want to think about things and get down to who they really are and invite them to be who they should be, to be in line with their own virtue and their own intelligence. Thank you very much. Any questions, arguments, or throwing rocks, whatever. Is there a microphone? Yeah, I'm going to try and bring it up like this. He's bringing out a spare.
I have five minutes left on my battery. Ask really quickly. <laughs> Do you recognize the difference between people who are cattle and people who are ranchers as far as promoting the ideas of statism and control? And do you feel that there's a difference between whether or not you should promote NAP and morality with those people who are cattle versus controllers, like the cattle ranchers, so to speak? Um, I actually think, other than a few genuine sociopaths, and those I wouldn't, you know, if I knew somebody was a sociopath, I wouldn't try to talk them into anything, because they're kind of a fundamentally different creature. They have no empathy, they don't care about other human beings, they're just kind of a scary thing we need to defend against. Everybody else, including a bunch that, that you might categorize as the cattle ranchers, I want them to give it up too. And as much as I like to, to bash state mercenaries, the truth is, cops are victims of the authoritarian uh, authoritarian propaganda just as much as everybody else. And that doesn't mean we have to go, oh, that's so nice, we won't do anything to defend ourselves. We absolutely have the right to defend ourselves. But they are victims of the same lie. And often they have a harder time giving it up. But I would give them the same chance, the same invitation to be moral, rational human beings. And I'm constantly surprised, especially in recent years, how often that works. And how many cops and soldiers I know who did go all the way from being devout, law-enforcing, authoritarian, to not even just voluntarist, but vocal voluntarist, out there spreading the word that this is what I believed and it was dangerous and destructive, I would give everybody the chance. Now, if they're attacking you, probably don't have a philosophical discussion with them. Just then, maybe defend yourself first, and if they're still alive and you're still alive, try it after that. Um, but I would use the same thing on the agents of the state because the agents of the state are slaves of the state just as much as their victims are. And they're nastier and it's easier to hate them because they're out there hurting people, but they are slaves just as much. In fact, the guy at the top is even a slave of his own delusions. And I don't care enough to want to free him most of the time, but he's still a slave of the same lie. Anybody else? In any context in which it was... <laughs> like he's done. In any context in which it legitimizes the game at all, I would say it's doing less than nothing. Because it is strengthening the idea that the game is legitimate, that it matters who wins elections, that constitutions can actually grant extra rights, that this whole ritual and, and, and circus that's put on, put on in front of us actually means something. The day will come when people will watch the, the old tapes of CNN and go, this is so bizarre, it's like watching cult rituals and most of the world looked at this and thought it was real. It's like watching them throw somebody in the volcano, the human sacrifice in the volcano. CNN is us watching people getting thrown into a volcano, and the day will come when everybody recognizes that. You cannot throw people into the volcano in a way that makes them not believe that there's a volcano god. It doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. You cannot play politics in a way to make people understand that politics is inherently bogus. <coughs> Yeah, how's it going? Um, I just have a question, uh, this game. <clears throat> Basically, what, um, I, just, I just kind of have an issue with, um, the, with your, uh, your usage of the word government. And um, basically, because I think you give them a little too much credibility. I think maybe the word should be um, organized crime. <laughs> and that would be uh, more, cause, and I think um, basically that terminology has a lot of you know, um, importance. And I think over you know years and years have been really dumbed down, and we really don't you know a lot of terminology has been changed a lot. You know, like you know Second Amendment, they talk about regulation. It really means to make regular, but they've twisted it around and to mean something completely different. <clears throat> and you know what if we just change the word you know the definition of government? Because government means to govern something, right? It means to like regular to control it. Like if you want to govern govern tyranny, you know for example, what if we're the government and we want to govern tyranny? It means we're going to, you know, control it, keep it from getting out of control in a sense. So if, what if that is your definition of government, then, you know, then uh, is, is government still a bad thing? And it's, yeah, it is hugely important to be clear in the terms, and I'm, I admit I'm not nearly as careful when I'm talking to an audience like this, because I assume they, they know such things and thought about such things. 
Um, in my book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, every single time you see the word government, there are quote marks around it. And that really annoyed a couple people who edited it and said, this is so annoying to watch. And I said, I have to do that. And at the beginning, I have to explain the reason there are quote marks around it is because there is no such thing. Because government is the exercise of authority, which means the right to rule. If nobody has the right to rule, there isn't government. There can be a gang, there can be organized crime, what you called it. The gang that most people call government, your literal description is the accurate description, it's organized crime. They view it as something else because they hallucinate authority to it. They think it's legitimate. They think it has the right to do it. They have the right to tax, the right to legislate, the right to play all these games. So they don't view it as crime. Uh, I think it's hugely important to make those distinctions and define the terms. Again, I'm a lot more sloppy about it when a crowd like this because I think most of us know those distinctions. Um, but I think, and there are, you know, there's always, there's the more general term of authority, like, well, I'm an authority on butterflies. Okay, well, you're probably not trying to rule the world by being an authority on butterflies. So I, you know, I have to clarify, I mean authority, meaning the right to rule, and government, meaning the gang that's imagined to have the right to rule, because you might use the term government to, you know, in, in, in even voluntary organizations. Um, so we do have to make those distinctions so people know what we're talking about. But when most people use the term government in the, the, the normal common sense, uh, they mean the gang that has the right to rule us. That They won't say gang, they don't use that term because they think it's legitimate. Um, and I know some people try, and I did this for years, and now I sort of make fun of my former self. <laughs> some people try to describe a thing that's actually legitimate and moral and still try to stick the label of, of government on it. Like people say, well, what if we had a government that only protected individual rights? And I said, if there was an organization that only protected individual rights, that would be great, but there's no reason to call it government. It's like saying, well, what if we... We have carjackers, but all they do is protect our cars against thieves. I would say, why on earth would you still want to call them carjackers? Why are you taking a label that des describes something inherently immoral and insisting on trying to stick it on something else? And which is why, to me, I'd say, don't even don't try to salvage it and somehow twist it into something it's never been in the history of the world. And and when people say, well, what about a government that only defends you know, only protects individual rights. I say, can you name one anywhere, anywhere in the world at any time in history? And if you can't, why are you trying to stick a label on something that has never existed anywhere at any time when that label, every single time it has ever been applied to anything anywhere in the history of humanity has described an inherently parasitic, violent gang of thugs? It's like, you wouldn't do that with carjacker. Why would you do it with government? And I know for myself it was uncomfortable to all the way give it up. So it felt like, well, maybe we can just put that term on something nice. Throw the term away. We don't need it. The term is attached to the mythology and the, the superstition. Chuck the whole thing out. Throw the baby out with the bathwater because this particular baby happens to be the son of Satan. <laughs> so, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's very important that, we, that we're precise in our terminology and people know what we're saying. Um, and know what the words actually mean because to be able to twist language is a really good way to be able to manipulate and control other people's minds which the control freaks have been very good at for a very long time and we have to untwist that and a lot of clarifying people's thoughts is clarifying their language making them know what they're saying because most of the time the status say things they don't even know what they're saying well government is us I mean that's one of the most bizarre things that I ever hear they they send you a bill and put you in a cage if you don't give the money and you can't distinguish between you and them like really like is a carjacker is he you too I am the carjacker in a way because he's <laughs> represent I mean it's literally insane but people are taught to spout back these complete insanities and they do it over and over again since they're really young and they assume there's truth in it and it is real because everybody around them says the same insanities representative. They represent us by bossing us around and taking our money and sticking us in a cage if we don't do what they say. In what other context would anybody call that representing? It's called oppressing. And so, yeah, language is a major tool of oppression because if you can control how someone thinks and the words they use, get them to call something evil, something sounds good. Like I was just 
saying that when I was up there talking to a few people earlier, we didn't abolish slavery. We abolished calling it slavery. As long as you call it being a law-abiding taxpayer, it's still perfectly legal. In fact, it's illegal not to be that. <laughs> we didn't do away with slavery. We just changed the label on it so people will accept it. And so, yeah, it's, it's important that the labels are clear so the thoughts and the principles are clear because then people can be free. Anything else? Larkin, I got a, a question. Alrighty. The, um, the Larkin that I've known over the years and got to know, you know, has evolved. I mean, you know, there's been emphasis and different kind of laser beaming and whatever. But, you know, to have of late, I'm getting the impression, you know, you're, you're, you're loving the police a little bit more, you know. You're gonna, you know, we, we, we want to we get them a way out. We want to, you know, be the, you know, be nice and kind of, you find it effective. And I'm wondering when that transition was. Because I didn't get that feeling when it was, uh, you know, when do you shoot a cop, okay? So I'm just, so it's, uh, but even though the article, it was, it was a title that got them, I know that. You read it, they read it, and they're like, damn it, I, I, I agreed with everything he said, you know? So I'm wondering when you made that transition, because you used to be a lot more confrontational. You used to be a lot more of a, oh, going to, ooh, and I got an AK, okay? So I'm wondering what made that change and when it happened why. To me, I would say it wasn't actually a transition in the state of mind. It's just a transition in how much I talk about both sides. Both sides were already there and are still there. If some cop has, tries to commit aggression against me, I have the right to escalate the force to whatever level it takes to stop him, including killing him. Now, in a lot of cases, I wouldn't because I would just end up dead. Um, but. I, so it's just a matter of how much I talk about, you know, I would like to invite you to be a free moral human being, and if you come to my door with guns, we're not going to have that discussion. We're going to have a discussion that sounds really loud and then people fall over and die. Um, so I'm still both, because there's, there's no inconsistency between the two. I do talk a whole lot more, and I guess to be blunt, the main thing that made that change is having... Uh, occasionally cops, but a lot of soldiers write to me and say, I just read your book and now I'm an anarchist and I'm still in the Marines and kind of wondering what to do about it and realizing we actually can get through to them. So I guess if there was any change, it was, I used to assume that you can't get through to them. You know, you have to occasionally defend yourself against them, but they're not going to wise up. And then seeing one after another, after another, after another, wising up and going from hired murderer to moral voluntarist who even says, I was a hired murderer. And then I figured out that was bad. What about age of the people that do that? Is it a primarily a young thing, or you have more seasoned officers going, wow, man, I, you the man on the books? It's actually some of each. I think it's probably more younger people, just because you know the less time you've been indoctrinated, the less time it, it takes to unindoctrinate you. Um, but I've been amazed by even how many you know, people who are, are a whole lot older, including a whole lot older than me, have dared to think about it, including former cops and, and former soldiers. And, um, and it, there really seems to be a, just a miracle happening. I don't, I've mentioned this before, I don't nearly know how to explain it, but the speed at which people get to the point where they dare to think about this or dare to talk about it at all seems to be hugely increasing. I mean, 10 years ago, when I would say the same things, you know, maybe I wasn't as practiced and I didn't understand as much about psychology or whatever, but I was already a full-blown anarchist. And I would say those things and almost nobody would listen, everybody have a, have a tantrum. And now, way more people of all ages suddenly seem so much more open to the discussion. And to me, that's the only step that matters. And I've met a bunch of people and as soon as they get to the point of, Okay, I think I see your point, but, but what do we do about, I already know they're done. Because I don't know anybody who got to that point who then backed up and said, no, I like fascism, please. As soon as they can think about it, they end up at the end. And it might take a long time, it might take a short time, although recently people have been getting there really fast. It's sort of embarrassing for me because it took me years and I see people doing it in weeks now. But they get there as soon as they can think about it because it's just this bizarre, irrational superstition. It's like Santa Claus. As soon as you think, wait, if there's this many houses and he does this in one night, you don't believe in Santa anymore. 
as soon as you start to think about it, it falls apart. The mythology falls apart. And it might take a while, and you might cling to it and feel sort of uncomfortable. My favorite thing, and I keep hearing this, and I love it every time I hear it, is somebody says, well, I'm not an anarchist yet. <laughs> what do you mean yet? It means they know they're going to end up there. They just don't want to let go. Come on, can I hang on to my security blanket a little while longer? I mean, I don't say I'm not a communist yet, because I'm not going that direction. You say yet when you know that's your destination. And it, it's so funny, and I hear that exact line. I must have heard it dozens of times now. People say, well, you know, I like this, and I, I'm not an anarchist yet, but, you know, I'm getting there, and I'm thinking about it. They know they're going to end up there, and I know they're going to end up there, and I usually just go, cool, you can watch videos and read books, and I don't even feel the need to say anything to you, because you're thinking about it, and you want to think about it, and I don't know anybody who hasn't ended up over there in that condition. Um, so as soon as people can have the discussion we win. Because in a rational or moral discussion, statism never beats voluntarism because statism is insane and immoral. Thank you. Anyone else? I want to make sure, man, it's Larkin Rose. I want to make sure you don't regret you didn't ask a question. Okay. Somebody on the left has a question. <laughs> Not on the political left, just over to the left. <laughs> When is, when is the software <coughs> or app or whatever it is it's going to be released? <sighs> Don't Burn. expect it in less than a year. It is a massive project. It's going to be an interactive thing that happens in a virtual world. From the perspective of the user, it all happens. It's all visual, computer-generated stuff, um, and it'll look really cool and be interesting and, and entertaining and stuff. It isn't just because. In theory, you could just write down the words on a piece of paper, and if you answer yes, go to page 387, and if you answer no, you know, that would be almost the same structure, but it would be boring and nobody would do it. This will be visually interesting enough um, that, that people will do it and have fun and find it interesting and tell other people to do it, which requires a huge amount of effort, which has nothing to do with the actual philosophy and concepts, which are pretty darn simple and have been understood by people for centuries. But to make it interesting and, and entertaining so people will do it, it's going to take a ton of work. I mean, I already have the software. I already know how to use it. Um, for every single user who does it, it will be a linear discussion. They're, they're going through it. They're answering the questions. It's one experience. Every single time there's a question, it could have gone another way. There's always a, a, another why every time there's a question, which means I have to program every option they could possibly go through and every answer to every question and where it all ends up based on all their answers. And the program keeps track of all their answers. And just to make it even harder for me, at any time they want, they get to back up and change one of their answers. And then it has to keep track of that and back up and start all over again. Um, visually, this cannot be done with cameras. But you can do it in a computer where they're actually moving through a world and where they go depends on how they answer. There's no cutting, there's no camera over here and camera over there. It's like, in, in real life, you don't suddenly have a different perspective. So for the person, it's a linear, personal, just going through it. But it's different for everybody who does it. Is your voice going to be the narrator? No. I hate my voice. <laughs> it's going to be female, first of all. Because, again, psychology is 99% of the game. Is it going to be Josie? It may be. <laughs> if it works. Um, right now, that's the plan. Uh, you want an Alma? <laughs> Alma's volunteering. No, no. <laughs> you want a volunteer? You can do a tryout. Donna has Stephanie. such a nice voice. <laughs> Donna does have a nice voice. <laughs> okay, well, throw your ring in the hat and we'll see what happens. Um, but it definitely won't be me. Stephen um, Murphy! Woo! Yeah, Stephen Murphy! Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to tell him about this in our relationship on this thing. What happened was Larkin is, goes around, he refuses to fly, he wants to drive, he goes, and there's always, you know, car problems. And, you know, Don and I have known that we've been doing this 25 years, I, I know. I wanted to help Larkin. He came and spoke at the summit, and he did a doubleheader with Will Grigg. That was awesome, okay? And the, the discussion was anarch, anarchism versus constitutionalism. And Will Grigg goes, am I the constitutionalist? You know? And I go, yeah, when you quit saying it in your bio, all this stuff, then we'll take that off, you know? And uh, so he's like, you know, I, 
I give up. I mean, it's already so. So it's already you know, everybody's coming that way. They're on their way. The um, the one thing after he had left, he had car problems, and he had a lot of events all around. Um, you know, I think it was Houston and in uh, Tennessee, Florida, and South Carolina. I mean, he's always making use of his drive. We had car problems, and everybody you know comes up and, and helps. And Tim Fry has always been very supportive, yep. and I want to help. And I go, I am so tired of worrying about Larkin all the time, okay? Because I need him to keep doing this. We all do. So I go, let us take the, the funding center and help you with your next project. Let's, let's go ahead and see what we can do with that. He put a number up of $50,000 to do this app thing. Well, he's already raised, I mean, if he updated, you're getting close to 10000 or yep. more or something, about $10,000. So I encourage you to go to the Funding Center of Freedoms Phoenix, and I got to tell them, you know, another one that we're going to be doing that's going to be drawing a lot of attention to him. We got all the high-end Bitcoin guys that are coming in to do a fundraiser alongside you for Richard Grove and, Tra Grove and Tragedy and Hope. So as they're doing that, one of the reasons I told them I wanted to do that was to bring a lot of traffic so they do a little Bitcoin for them some Larkin. Okay, so this starts next week, not this week, but the following week. And I, I hugely appreciate that. And, and I said from the beginning, this has to be something free. You can't make people pay to mess with their own paradigms. You know, it's hard enough to invite them to think about something without saying, hey, will you please give me 20 bucks to tell you how wrong you are about the world? <laughs> Doesn't work too well. So I knew to begin with, this is going to be free to the whole world, so I have to work my butt off for at least a year to do something that I can't charge anybody for. So, uh, so and I said, the only way it's gonna happen is if people make it so I don't starve, so me and my family don't starve to death in the process. And so I hugely appreciate um, the support we've got so far so we can make this thing actually happen and let it go. And I think, you know, we, we will want to promote it every way we can possibly think of. Um, and if it turns out the way I, I think it will or I know it will, um, I think a lot of people are going to want to hand it off to other people, and that's really important. It's the you know the, the whole word of mouth thing, um, and I've I've had pretty much of that just with the most dangerous superstition. You know, people say, "Well, I read this book; it's amazing. I bought some for my friends." Um, and that's the thing is, if freedom, you know, aren't we here because we want the whole world to be free? It isn't because I you know I understand it, and I don't really mind being stomped on, and the rest of the world be enslaved. We want the world to be free, which means we want to give what we have to other people. Because it's more fun to be a free human being than be a slave. And the more inviting the, or, or the more pleasant the invitation can be to people and the more fun they can have becoming free and the, the, as much as we can remove the discomfort and the confrontation and the arguing. I mean, in this, this interactive thing, there will be no arguing, there will be no stress, there's no judgment. There's no reason to get defensive because there's nobody even there to get defensive at. Um, and so basically, the nicest deprogramming, the most pleasant deprogramming we can get to completely demolish somebody's paradigm that they've had smashed into their head since the time they were three. Um, so I, I can't, can't express how much I appreciate the support we've gotten already to make this thing happen because I do think it's going to have a huge impact and it wouldn't happen <coughs> if people weren't giving support to make it happen. So thank you so much.